So in this video, what we are looking at is how carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. One of my questions that I like to ask my students is, how do you think CO2 is transported inside the blood? And in most cases, my students will say, well, um, oxygen binds to hemoglobin and they are transported inside the red blood cells. So therefore, I think CO2, carbon dioxide also goes through the same steps. They will go into the red blood cell, bind to the hemoglobin, and they are transported inside the blood. Um, in most cases, uh, in, when you think about the answer, the answer is almost technically correct, or rather, that's not the full story. Carbon dioxide transportation inside the blood is a little bit more complicated than that. So let's talk about it. We have our body cells and our body cells produce CO2. I'm drawing out the capillaries here and the CO2 will diffuse into the blood through the capillary walls. Um, and they diffuse because the body cell has a higher partial pressure or higher concentration of CO2 and the blood has a lower partial pressure or lower concentration of CO2. So diffusion works from a higher to lower concentration gradient or down the concentration gradient. So once CO2 diffuses into the blood, then what happens? Well, the first thing is now when the CO2 is in the blood plasma, see, notice that I'm drawing out the red blood cell and Outside the red blood cell is the plasma, which is known as the liquid part of the blood. If you remember, the plasma is mostly made out of water and some dissolved substances. So, you see, only about 5% of the CO2 can dissolve inside the plasma because carbon dioxide themselves are not actually very polar molecules. In fact, we call them nonpolar molecules. And because they are nonpolar, they have difficulty interacting with water. Therefore, they cannot really dissolve in water. That is why only 5% of them will actually dissolve inside the plasma. So about 95% of the CO2 will then diffuse or enter the red blood cell and 10% of the carbon dioxide will bind together to the hemoglobin to form something called carb-aminohemoglobin. Quite a mouthful of, quite a mouthful, isn't it? Carb-aminohemoglobin. And a few students will go, wait a second, it's only 10% that binds to hemoglobin? I thought all the CO2 binds to hemoglobin. In fact, no, very little carbon dioxide directly binds to hemoglobin to form carb-aminohemoglobin. Now let's break down that very long word. Carbaminohemoglobin can be broken down into three parts. Hemoglobin being, you know, the pigment or the protein inside the red blood cell. Carb, which references or corresponds to the carbon dioxide. And amino. Now, the amino in this case means the protein part. You see, when CO2 binds to hemoglobin, I'm drawing out the hemoglobin here. You can see the four polypeptide chains and the heme group, which I've represented in the red dots. The CO2 does not bind to the heme group like oxygen does. Oxygen binds to the heme group, but carbon dioxide actually does not bind to the heme group. In fact, carbon dioxide only binds to something called the terminal amine groups of the polypeptide chain. Terminal amine groups being the, uh, the last amine group of each polypeptide chain. So each hemoglobin has four polypeptide chains, and therefore they have four terminal amine groups. That's basically what it is. But if you do not want to explain that in the exam, it is sufficient for you to say that carbon dioxide binds to the polypeptide chain of hemoglobin. That's good too. The point is, I don't want you to say that carbon dioxide binds to the heme group because that is wrong. That is why it gets the name carb amino hemoglobin because the carbon dioxide binds to the amine group of the hemoglobin. That's where the nomenclature or the naming comes from. So from 95% of it, 10% binds to the hemoglobin directly. So you are left with 85% of it. So in this 85% of the carbon dioxide, what they will do is they will then bind together with water and they're catalyzed by an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase. And together, they will form something known as carbonic acid. 
Now, carbonic acid's chemical formula is H2CO3, okay? So what happens is the carbonic acid is the one that will then split to become hydrogen carbonate ions, which are negative ions, and hydrogen ions, which are positive ions. Now, those hydrogen ions will then bind directly to hemoglobin to form hemoglobinic acid, HHB, and the hydrogen carbonate ions will diffuse into the plasma. And 85% of carbon dioxide is actually transported this way. You see, hydrogen carbonate ions are anions. They are polar molecules, okay? And because they are polar, they have charges. They, it is very easy for them to dissolve in the plasma. That is why most of the carbon dioxide is actually transported this way, which is 85% of it. So this is the complicated nature in the way of, in which carbon dioxide is transported. Now, we're still not done yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, remove a few of the clutters. I want to remove the 5% and the carb amino hemoglobin so that we focus on the 85% of the carbon dioxide. So in this 85% of the carbon dioxide, they will bind with water, form carbonic acid, split to become hydrogen ion and hydrogen carbonate ions, and uh, hydrogen ions will bind to hemoglobin. Let's focus on that first part. So there's an important point to note when hydrogen ion binds to hemoglobin. You see, they form, they need to form hemoglobinic acid for two very important reasons. The first important reason is if you leave hydrogen ion to float around inside the cytoplasm, it is much too dangerous. It is dangerous because if you study chemistry, you know that hydrogen ion contributes to acidity. So when you have too much hydrogen ion floating around, it lowers the blood pH. Now, I don't need you to memorize this next part, but I just need you to understand that blood pH is about 7.35 to 7.45, okay? Anytime your blood pH goes any lower, in fact, it goes down to even like 7.05 or 7.15. In medicine, we say that this is acidosis or the blood pH is too acidic in nature. And this is dangerous because there's too much hydrogen ion floating around. So to solve this problem or to, to, to evade this danger, the hemoglobin will bind to the hydrogen ions and the acidic effect is then reduced. So the hemoglobin acts as a buffer. Some students will notice that when hemoglobin binds to a hydrogen ion, it forms hemoglobinic acid. And they will ask me, wait, hemoglobinic acid is also an acid. Isn't that dangerous? We don't have to worry because hemoglobinic acid is a weak acid. So it does not acidify or lower the blood pH as much. So that's a good thing. So just to show you as an example here, I have a red blood cell and the pH inside the red blood cell is 7.35 and CO2 diffuses into the red blood cell, binds together with water, forms carbonic acid and the carbonic acid splits to become many hydrogen ions and many hydrogen carbonate ions. Notice what happens to the blood pH. The blood pH becomes 7.15. And I told you this is not a good thing. We call this acidosis and it's quite dangerous. The reason it can be quite dangerous is because it throws off the natural pH of the blood. It may cause very important proteins such as uh, enzymes in your blood to denature. And you don't want that to happen because they may not be able to function at their optimum level. So to solve this problem, what happens then? The hydrogen ion binds directly to the hemoglobin to form something called hemoglobinic acid. So the hemoglobin traps the hydrogen ion and look at the blood pH. The blood pH goes back up to 7.35 and this is a good thing. So the pH of the blood remains stable at that optimum level. Uh, do you have to memorize that blood pH is 7.35? You don't have to. But it's good to know that when you have more CO2, it will make the blood more acidic. That's a good, that's a good point to take note of, by the way.
Um, now, the next part that we must also understand is the formation of hemoglobinic acid is also important because when hydrogen ion binds, binds to hemoglobin, it causes the hemoglobin to readily release oxygen. And you go, hey, wait a second, that sounds familiar. It is familiar. You have studied it. It's called the Bohr effect or the Bohr shift. So the Bohr effect or the Bohr shift states that when you have more CO2, it leads to more carbonic acid, which leads to more hydrogen ions, which leads to more formation of hemoglobinic acid, and it forces the hemoglobin to release its oxygen. And if you look at the part where I just bridge it in yellow, it is just basically the part where I have said, so when you have more carbon dioxide, it will cause the hemoglobin to release more oxygen readily. So you are like, oh, that's where the Bohr shift happens. So that is the summary. So that is how the Bohr shift happens in a more comprehensive manner. That's basically it. So to draw it out again, so as you can see here, if I'm just showing it to you here, I'm just drawing on an uh, uh, oxyhemoglobin. And if you remember, hemoglobin binds to four oxygen molecules due to four heme groups. So when the CO2 enters into the red blood cell, it binds together with water, it forms carbonic acid, splits to become hydrogen ion and hydrogen carbonate ion. The hydrogen ion binds to the hemoglobin and it forces the hemoglobin to release oxygen. If Is this good? This is actually a fantastic thing that needs to happen. Why? Because, remember, if you look back into your red blood cell in the capillary, Remember, the body cell has a low partial pressure of oxygen because it's constantly using up oxygen. So the body cell constantly needs oxygen for aerobic respiration. So as you can see, the CO2 diffuses into the blood. It will form, it will bind together with water. I'm repeating myself again. It forms carbonic acid. The carbonic acid splits to become hydrogen carbonate ions and hydrogen ions. And the hydrogen ion interacts with the hemoglobin and it forces the hemoglobin to release the oxygen. This is good because when it forces the hemoglobin to release oxygen, what does the oxygen do? The oxygen will diffuse into the body cells where they are very much needed. So this is good. This is how ball effect happens in a more complex or comprehensive manner. So the formation of hemoglobinic acid is important for two reasons. It is important for number one, to make sure that the uh, pH of the blood does not significantly, de significantly decrease and it also tells the hemoglobin or it forces the hemoglobin to readily release the oxygen for so that the body cells can uh, so that the body cells can receive the oxygen that they very much need. Now, another very important point to note is the hydrogen carbonate ion. You see, when the hydrogen carbonate ions are formed, they will then diffuse out of the blood and dissolve in the plasma. When hydrogen carbonate ions diffuse out of the cells, chloride ions will move into the cells to rebalance the negative charges this significant process is known as the chloride shift. Now, why does this chloride shift actually need to happen? I told you, if you see that, I've told you that it rebalances the negative charge. But what do I mean by that? So let's consider it. So you have, you have some carbon dioxide. Okay, I'm repeating myself again. They diffuse into the red blood cells. Fine. So, and then the carbon dioxide interacts with water and they form carbonic acid. And the carbonic acid will then split to become many hydrogen ions and many hydrogen carbonate ions. So far, so good. Now, I want you to focus. Look there in my diagram. I've drawn out five hydrogen ions, which are five positive charges, and five hydrogen carbonate ions, which have five negative charges. In this case, we say that the, the charge within the red blood cell is balanced because there is an equal amount of positive and negative charges. This is good for the red blood cell. But when the hydrogen carbonate ions diffuse out, what happens is now you have an abundance or there are too much cations or positive ions within the red blood cell which throws off the 
balance of the charge. And this may, again, affect important proteins within the red blood cells. So we don't want the charges in the red blood cells to be either too positive or too negative. This is a problem. So to compensate for the lack of negative charges within the red blood cells, chloride ions from the plasma diffuse in. And the charges within the red blood cell is now rebalanced, where you have an equal amount of positive and negative charges. That's basically why the chloride shift needs to happen. So there are very significant points that we need to note here with hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbonate ions. Uh, they may ask a lot of questions on this part. I would like you as students to understand why hemoglobinic acid formation is important and why the chloride shift is also very important as well. So to summarize the whole thing, let's bring it all back together. When you have carbon dioxide diffused into the blood, 5% of them will dissolve into the plasma and about most of them will diffuse into the red blood cells. And out of that, 10% of them will bind together with hemoglobin to form carb amino hemoglobin. As a reminder, carbon dioxide does not directly bind to the heme group, but they bind to the amine group or the polypeptide chain of the hemoglobin. Now, the rest of the carbon dioxide will bind together with water catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid will then split to become hydrogen carbonate ions, and the hydrogen carbonate ions, which are polar, diffuse out of the red blood cells so that they can dissolve easily inside the plasma. 85% of carbon dioxide is transported this way. But to compensate for the lack of negative charges inside the red blood cells, or to rebalance the charges inside the red blood cells, the chloride shift happens where chloride ions move into the red blood cells. Now, when the carbonic acid splits, it did form the hydrogen carbonate ions, and it also formed hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions will then bind to hemoglobin to form hemoglobinic acid. This is good for two reasons, because it prevents the blood pH from decreasing too much or making the blood too acidic, and it also makes the hemoglobin readily release more oxygen. That's basically it. So questions that they may ask in the exam is, they may say, list out the three ways carbon dioxide is transported in our blood. The three ways are, number one, dissolved in plasma, number two, transported as carb amino hemoglobin, or number three, transported as hydrogen carbonate ions in the plasma. Those are the three ways. Other questions that they may ask is, why is it important that hemoglobin binds to hydrogen ions? The reason is because they need to do that so that it prevents a sharp decrease of pH, or it's to make sure that the pH does not become too acidic, and it also makes the hemoglobin release more oxygen. Why must the chloride shift happen? It's to make sure that the electrical charges within the red blood cell or the ionic charge within the red blood cell is not imbalanced. Other questions that they may ask is, they may say, explain why more carbon dioxide leads to blood pH becoming more acidic. The answer to that question is because CO2 binds with water to form carbonic acid and carbonic acid splits to become hydrogen ion and hydrogen carbonate ions. And the hydrogen ion makes the blood pH lower or slightly more acidic. These are some of the ways the questions can be asked in the exam.